I'm sorry y'all, I'm going to start this video off with an apology because I am going to hurt some feelings. Today I'm going to break down the worst investments for new investors, alright? Why would I apologize for something like that? That's because one, some people don't watch the full video, so they don't get the full context and they get very upset, okay? The other thing is, I'm very specific about what I'm saying. For new investors, if you have been investing for two years or less, these investments probably aren't for you. Now, if you've been investing for 10 years or more, you have more than $300,000 invested, then fine. This does not apply. This is for new investors. I'm going to break down each and every reason as to why. And I'm going to start off with the one that is most popular on TikTok, on Threads, on X, on Twitter, on whatever else it is that you want to call it. And that is a lot of these life insurance investments. Keyword, not just life insurance life insurance investments. This includes whole life policies. This includes the IULs, the Index Universal Life Insurance Policies. And as a bonus, as a bonus, I'm actually going to break it down with our whiteboard. So let's go ahead and jump into the IUL piece and I'll go over the other ones too. Now for beginners and for those that may not know, the basics of an IUL, Index Universal Life Insurance Policy, is this. You are investing in life insurance and it is going to track the stock market, which means it's going to do just as good as the stock market. It Except this, if the stock market falls, you won't lose any money. One, that sounds great. And then also, at the end of, the t of your life, your heirs get a good chunk of money at the end of the day, and that money is guaranteed. Also great, what other people will tell you as well, is you can loan yourself money from the policy and that money is tax free. That is true, but there are some catches because all these people that tell you this stuff, they tell you every single one of the benefits and they don't tell you what. Think about it, what, what are they leaving out? They're leaving out the fees. All right. So for those that don't remember or don't know, I did have my life insurance license. I was a financial advisor. I have counseled dozens and dozens of millionaire clients all the time. I'm here to tell you, yeah, sometimes they have life insurance policies, but it's not the source of their wealth. So let's go ahead and break it down real quick. So for example, and this again, this is an example. Not every policy is the same. Anybody that's trying to sell your life insurance policy, ask them for an illustration and show them, um, ask them to break out the fees in dollars. Don't look at the percentages because you can throw off percentages, right? You don't always know exactly when you look at a percentage what the exact dollar amount is, but you understand money. So ask them to make sure that it's in dollar amounts. But here's an example. So for an IUL, let's say that you are investing $200 per month. Okay, sounds good. You get a policy $200 a month, it's something you can afford, something that makes sense. And that money is gonna grow at 7% per year. That sounds amazing, except this. What happens is that person is gonna get a commission. The insurance company is going to take some money and then you're gonna pay fees for the investment that you are buying. So what happens is about $85 comes out in fees and you end up with 115 per month. Now again, this is an example from, from my experience and the experience I've seen from clients and people who come to me and say, hey, here's my insurance statement. Like, does this make sense? These are the fees that I see. Now again, look at your specific policy or wherever the salesperson is and look at their fees to see how they stack up here. Okay, so this is my example for what I've seen. But in either case, you invest in $200 a month, and $85 come out in fees, they don't tell you that, but what you're actually investing is this $115 per month. Also, in most cases, when they say you can loan yourself the money that's in the policy after so long, well, think about it. You put in $200, but you can only loan yourself $115. Who benefits there? Like, why can't I loan myself the entire amount? Right, that's because a bunch of it they have taken for themselves and it's not always the best deal for you. But let's compare this to just a regular index fund and this is one of the best investments for new investors. So if I do this, index fund, and in this case, I invest $200 per month, okay? Now in this case, how much am I paying in fees here? Almost nothing, almost nothing, and that's because some of the most popular index funds will charge you 0.03%. Okay, now remember I said put it in dollars. That is approximately six cents. That's it. So you're really investing at the end of the day, was that 199.40 per month. Okay, now what is better for you to invest $115 a month or close to $200, $199.40 to be exact. Who do you think is gonna end up better? Especially if both 
you both of you are investing in the stock market at roughly 7% a year, which is what the stock market has returned after inflation. Think about that. Just $115 a month or a person who's investing $200. Who's going to end up with more money? After 20 years, you're going to have about $40,000 if you are investing in the, the IUL. In the stock market, for the index fund, you're going to have about $104,000 at the end of 20 years. Okay, now which one do you want? Do you want the 40,000 or do you want the 104,000? That's about a $64,000 difference just from fees alone. This is why it does not make sense for most new investors. Usually these expensive policies are better for people who are already wealthy and have already maxed out of their 401k, maxed out of their IRA and have done real estate or whatever else it was they were going to invest in. In my estimation for what I have seen, this is for people who have, who have invested well over $30,000 per year. And if you still have money left over, that is usually where it makes sense for these insurance policies. If you have not done that, Usually not for you, just based on the expenses alone. Now, those who sell life insurance policies are going to tell you a bunch of stuff, including, well, does the index fund come with tax-free benefits? Does the index fund allow you to loan money against it? Does the index fund uh, provide cash value or money tax-free to your heirs? One, yes, you can loan yourself money from an index fund. I can have my money in my 401k. I can take a 401k loan. I can do that. Now, whether or not this is a good decision or not is a different story. If I have an investing account, I can take a loan on that too if I choose. Again, is that the best decision? Personally, no, I don't think it is, but that is something that is possible. The other thing too is I can just get a very much cheaper insurance policy, a term life insurance policy for $20, $30, $40, $50 dollars a month and promise my heirs $100,000. So I don't need to spend $200 a month just to get that same protection. So you want to be very careful about that. There are other ways to get those other protections. The only thing that this index fund does not have is protection if the stock market falls. That is true, but what am I paying for it? You're basically paying between these two options, $60,000 to protect against the stock market falling. And the question should be, how often does the stock market fall? You might be, you might feel like it's every day, but it's really not. If you go back to 2000, I think there have only been six times that the stock market has, has ever fallen. You had the dot com era, right? That was three years. You had the 2008 crisis. You had 2018. You had 2022. Not even in the pandemic in 2020, the stock market at the end of the year was not negative. It was not. Okay, so the first one, IULs, all these expensive life insurance policies, not great for new investors. But that's not it. That is not it. I still got three more that we need to cover. The next one here is option trading. Option trading is a very advanced technique that I do not at all recommend to people who are new to investing. And that is simply because what is an option? An option contract is what is called a derivative, which means that the value of the option is based on its underlying asset, which means that how well this option contract does is based on something else, the value of a stock or the value of a mutual fund or technically an ETF. What that means is if I'm in, if I don't understand the stock market, right? If I'm new and this contract value is based on how Apple does, but I don't know anything about the stock or what Apple is doing, you don't know what you're doing. And that's very, very dangerous. And option contracts can be very volatile. Apple can be, go up 5%, but then you lose 50, depending on what option strategy you have done. Please, please, please stay away from option trading if you're a new investor. There are option strategies that are very simple and that are better than most. But again, until you understand the stock market on a basic level, don't mess with option trading. Personally, and I've taught this in my courses as well. I tell people flat out, unless you've been investing for three to five years, please stay away from option contracts because they can be so, so dangerous. Next one here is leveraged ETFs. Okay. ETFs are called exchange traded funds. This is one of the most popular types of investments, the ETF part of it, where you are putting a bunch of stocks together for the package of one. ETFs by themselves are great. They are amazing. They're inexpensive. They can do a bunch of things for you. And and again, one of the best things out there that you can buy. But leverage ETF, now that's different. The way that these work is by they multiply your gains or your losses. And sometimes people fall into these and don't realize what is actually going on. So in some cases, you can have a leveraged ETF that has the, the letters or the numbers 2X, which means that if the stock market performs a certain way, you can double your return. 
problem is if the stock market doesn't go the way that you need it to, it can go double in the opposite direction. If you are new and you don't realize that, it can be extremely, extremely dangerous. So not good for new investors. That is definitely an expert strategy where you can kind of guess where the market is going and double your return in a single day, which is great if you know what you are doing. And again, if you're brand new, you're gambling at that point. So definitely stay away from leveraged ETFs. The next one here, I know it's gonna hurt some feelings too. I'm sorry, crypto. If you are new, you wanna be very, very careful about crypto. And the reason why, and right now crypto is up, so things seem fine, but the reason why you wanna be careful of crypto is because it can be very volatile. And if you go back and look at the history of a lot of these cryptocurrencies, the average drop is about 50% every two to three years. Remember, if you lose 50%, you're going to need 100% just to break even. And the stock market doesn't even fall 50% that often. Okay, if you really go back and look at the history of the stock market, it's gonna be a while before you scroll back and find a time where the stock market was down 50%. But if I'm looking at Bitcoin and some of these others, 50% here, 60% here, it, it's hard, right? It, it, actually, it's easy. It's very easy to find a, a Bitcoin bear market where the market falls 20% or more. And it happens far too often for new investors. And the problem is you can just happen to invest when it, you know, when things are great, it falls 50% and then you're stuck and you don't know what's going on. Also, cryptocurrencies are 24 seven market where if you're new, you're constantly looking at this cryptocurrency and don't know what's really going on. And the last reason why I would avoid crypto for new investors is it's difficult to evaluate and difficult to understand for, again, for new investors. What is the difference between Disney and Microsoft? You as a brand new investor already know that. You, are, you're in, you instinctively know the differences between Disney and Microsoft. One's an entertainment company, one makes movies, Disney World, right? The other one makes computers, Microsoft. You know that, right? You know the differences between those two. You know that if people stop traveling, guess what? Disney stock's probably gonna fall, right? You know that. That, that you can understand very quickly. What are the, the intricacies and the difference between Litecoin and Ethereum? Most people don't know. Most new investors do not know all of that stuff behind it. So that is one reason by itself why you might want to avoid it because it's very difficult to evaluate. The last one here is penny stocks. Penny stocks are companies that are usually $5 or below. They're extremely cheap and the allure, the, the magic of penny stocks is that you feel like you can buy 100 shares, 200 shares, and hopefully something happens and it goes up by four or five, 600%. That's great in theory. That's great in theory, but there are two things that you need to know. Number one, if a stock is that cheap, there's a reason. There's a reason why that company is cheap. Perhaps they're going bankrupt. I don't want to invest in a bankrupt company. You probably don't want to either, but also these can be manipulated. We saw several of these happen back in the pandemic. They still happen now where you'll see people on Twitter or sometimes these Reddit groups or even these WhatsApp groups will do what is called a pump and dump. They will tell everybody about the stock and they'll buy it for super cheap and then wait for you to buy it for even higher and then they'll sell it. They will get off with the bag and leave you as the bag holder, meaning you lost money on that investment and this happens every single year people hype up all these cheap companies because they got in super early and then left you with all the hype and all the the, the what's left over right and you lost money because of it and that almost never works and the problem is and i've done a video on this as well where when you're investing you lose 50 60 70 percent it's gonna take you a very, very long time to gain that money back. There are a lot of companies like, let's take Peloton for example, if you lose 90%, which is where Peloton is right now, depending on when you're looking, you're gonna need 900% just to break even. What is gonna gain 900% in any relative time frame, right? When you lose that type of money, now as a beginner, you're like, oh, I, I, gotta, I gotta hit big. I have to shoot harder. I have to go get the next big thing because I'm down so much. And then you end up in a cycle of losses. So that's something that you absolutely want to avoid if you are a new investor. Now, you might be thinking, okay, Kevin, you sat here and told me all the stuff that I should not invest in if I'm a new investor. Where are the places I should invest? What app should I use and what stocks should I invest in? If that is the question that you have, then you wanna check out this video right here.